Hey, and welcome to FutureThinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to FutureThinkers.org slash start. This is part two of our interview with Joe Brewer, Executive Director at the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution, Complexity Researcher, Cognitive Scientist, an evangelist for regenerative cultural design. Today we talk about modern versions of rites of passage that can be relevant for young people today and why they are important, as well as the ways to support cultural evolution and develop regenerative cultures that are capable of dealing with global problems and existential risks. To get all the links and show notes for this episode, go to futurethinkers.org 91. And to check out part one of this interview, go to futurethinkers.org 90. Check out A Course in Personal Evolution. Adapting Age-Old Wisdom for a Modern Life of Purpose and Meaning. Go to futurethinkers.org slash evolution. This is something I really want to talk about a little more because this is, Rites of Passage has been something we've been really exploring. We've kind of done our own versions of it through travel and exploration since we left Canada. I'm wondering what you think are kind of the ideal new versions of rites of passage that would be relevant for today's young people and and how we could implement these things? Um, Well, I'm going to go away from the word ideal first and say, what is is the most practical and likely? Right. And then we can come back to the ideal from it. And I want to do this because uh, I don't want to see a pull off another direction and miss this. The, The main catalyst for this transformational process is going to be the breakdown of our system. It will be collapsed processes. Specifically, it will mostly be climate refugees. It'll be catastrophic uh, events like flooding, fires, uh, hurricanes, uh, wars and conflict, droughts, collapse of food systems. You have these things that are already happening and they're intensifying that as people's lives become broken, they will be thrown into the chasm. And so we're about to have you know, 100 million people probably in the next 10 years to 15 years, a billion people in the next 30 to 50 years, uh, maybe more. You know, we don't know the high end, but we know that it's going to be a large number of people that are going to be thrown into this process of tra- traumatic destruction of life world. Their life worlds will no longer work. So let, let's ask the question there, and then we can come back to more of the ideal. Because people are already starting to prototype education processes for this. For example, in refugee camps, people are starting to uh, offer permaculture trainings and begin to set up landscape restoration projects. And this is an example of what I think we need to be doing. Is uh, At the core of the devastation in these problems is the shame and the guilt of knowing that humans are fundamentally a cause of the problems. So if I'm a parent and I have a child and I'm in a refugee camp and I know that human management of the land is part of the reason why I was removed from my land and my child is in this vulnerable place right now, I don't have to consciously know all the connections, but I can feel that people did this, humans are bad. I might externalize it to some other tribe and do some other thing. Um, But I make it, the story is humans are the problem. The therapy is humans are the healing solution. Mm. The body-based practice of humans as the healing solution. So as people are going through this, this really dangerous time of my life world is broken, humans are the problem, what can we do in an educational sense is give these exact people the training and the experience, the bodily meditative, reflective practice of making the soil work better, of cleaning the water, of planting the trees, of anchoring the soil so it doesn't erode away, of growing food. You know, these very basic things that are also how we regenerate landscapes and restore balance and harmony for the planet. But they're also the way for educating people in the midst of that crisis of meaning, which is about to be a crisis shared by a huge number of people. So if we ask the question, then what is the preparation in an ideal sense? It's a train the trainers model. How many people will be trained to deploy into these crisis places and train this huge number of people? 
what are the life courses of you know, teenagers today? Because mostly it would be teenagers are like a really strategic intervention level. These young people who are looking at graduating from their high schools, going to college, see that path as not really making much sense. And then saying, what do I do instead? See, these are also the people who are ready for an initiation ritual. They're right on the cusp of it. So for these people, what they need is work study programs, immersion programs. They need to go and learn permaculture and related things. I mean, I'm using permaculture in a very broad sense here. They need to learn how to relate to, listen to, participate with their environments. And they need to be trained and certified so that they have a kind of a quality of education and also a confidence in themselves. It's like when I got a black belt in goju ryu karate, I knew that I had achieved something because they didn't just give that to me. I had to work and demonstrate it. With permaculture, you do a project, you work and you demonstrate it. So uh, I see the ideal model for preparing people is to teach them regenerative practices and empower them to be leaders and educators for all of the others who are about to experience anguish. And a lot of their initiation ritual will be leaving their current lives to go and do this instead. And so it'll be the preparation for departure, the uh, letting go of the stories of what their, their societies tell them they should do to do this instead, to have mentors who are ready to guide them in the transition and to begin training them as they move into their new worlds, to really give them the room to fail and the projects that they're doing so they can deeply learn, which is preparation. And then the real initiation is to deploy them into a crisis. Mm -hmm. Deploy them into a crisis where others are going to lean on them for survival and they have to support those other people. And then they will, they will be in the crucible and they'll have to prove themselves. Wow, that's really profound. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also exactly what's needed in the world right now. So if you want to ask, how do we get a huge number of people to change their behavior? You find those who are looking to do something different anyway. Give them the opportunity to do something different. Prepare them to be crisis managers and then get ready for the tsunami of anguish as it's coming. And, and this is just, you know, trend analysis for planetary change. So, um, so this is why I said I started with the pragmatic and then came back to the ideal because then we can understand how to do it. And we ground it in the network of permaculture projects, regenerative projects, landscape restoration projects. These are the training grounds for the preparation for the uh, initiation rituals. And then the initiation rituals are the departure from community to the crisis zones to help people. Yeah. And the regeneration itself is such a necessary part of any initiation ritual because you can't just leave people in the pit, you know? Yeah. Because you have to build their way out. Yes. You have yeah. to come out and somehow reintegrate into society and find something worth living for. Because I I can speak for myself that, you know, my uh phase of nihilism lasted over a decade and it kind of came and went in waves. But, you know, the point of where I left green and the point of where I arrived at Teal was so long and arduous and horrible and I just saw no end to it until a very traumatic event kind of pushed me forward and, and made me develop that last little bit but you know I didn't really have the support and I didn't have a framework for like okay what do I do after this so yeah, having also, that reintegration aspect is so key Reintegration. So there's another thing about reintegration, and let's use metamorphosis within a caterpillar changing to a butterfly. Um, so we're going to talk about morphogenetics, you know, the, the developmental process for structure in organisms, or, or what's called ontogenetics, which is the, the, the body plan in, as a developmental process for any organism. How do you go from whatever the germinating cell is to the, the mature adult organism? And one of the things that happens with the caterpillar becoming the butterfly is that there are millions of years of evolutionary, actually billions of years of evolutionary history that have created all of the moment to moment genetic, chemical, 
you know, biochemical processes that enable the organism's body to know what to do at each step of the way. And so while the organism doesn't consciously know, you know, the caterpillar does not know the butterfly, but the, the genome and the phenome, you know, the, ph the phenotype is the specific expression of genetic traits for um, physical body as well as behavior. That's the phenotype. So the phenome is the collection of all possible phenotypes. The genome is capable of generating all of the phenotypes. So basically you have some genetic material, but the genetic material needs to be acted out developmentally to produce a viable organism. And the viable organism produces a specific phenotype, meaning that from all of the genetic possibilities, some combination of structural and behavioral things come out. At each step of the way, the developmental context determines what genetic programs are activated. You know, something happens that says, produce more of this protein. This hormone is released that says, uh, I need these seven different kinds of proteins because they're all connected through other hormone signaling processes. And those seven different uh, proteins in the right combination begin a developmental process. It's a structural developmental process. And the caterpillar knows this, I'd use my fingers says knows it because of thousands or millions of generations in the past of cumulative evolution of ontogenetic process. What I mean is every step of development, ev evolution has shaped what is likely to occur next. And here we are as humans without that evolutionary history, meaning we're trying to make a singular transition, an unprecedented transition. And so we do not have this ontogenetic evolutionary history. We don't have a developmental process that tells us what to do to become a planetary steward. And so this means we're in the realm of what um, Maynard Smith and Swazmarthy call evolutionary transitions, which depending on how you count them, there have between, been between six and 11 in the history of the earth. So um, the first one was the, was the emergence of life. Second one was from, um, single cell to multi-celled organism, or I'm sorry, from prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells, just collaboration among multiple microorganisms. And then from uh, single cell to multi cell this would be the, the third one. You keep going and there's somewhere between six and 11 of these. An evolutionary transition is when the selection process of evolution operated on, on autonomous organisms at a level where they achieved some kind of symbiotic relationship but evolution still selected for them as individuals. And then eventually their symbiosis became functionally integrated and interdependent such that selection now occurs at that interdependence level. And it is weakened at the autonomous individual level. So the autonomous individual cannot survive on its own and it can only survive interdependently. The famous example is mitochondria entering the cell of another bacteria, enabling the transition from prokaryote to eukaryote cells, to cells that have organ structures within them. That's the classic historic example. So because evolutionary transitions are very rare, they have no precedent in history. One reason they're very rare is that they're very likely to fail. Now they're unlikely to succeed. They might be attempted a lot of times, but they fail most of the time. Here we are as humans, yeah, and the best argument for this is in E.O. Wilson's book, The Social Conquest of Earth, where he has this metaphor of a labyrinth where every step, you know, as you're going through a labyrinth, you have choices where you could turn left or right. If you think of each left and right turn in the labyrinth as an evolutionary choice where the ancestors chose a an evolutionary path of one kind instead of another, and then when you come to the next place in the labyrinth, you make another evolutionary choice, the likelihood of getting to the end of the labyrinth is two to the power of the number of turns. And he constructed um, uh, a calculation for eusociality, or eusociality is complex social organism, or a co complex social organization of a species. So ants, termites, bees, and wasps are all eusocial. 
Humans are eusocial. A couple of other mammals might be eusocial. Basically, there are very few of them in the history of life on Earth. And he constructs this calculation that for a mammal to become eusocial is something like two to the power of 20 or two to the power of 30. Except then to say the likelihood is one divided by that number, meaning that it's astronomically unlikely for any planet to produce a eusocial mammal, meaning a mammal with this complex social organization, a capacity for empathy and a capacity for conceptual thought. Humans are the only organism in the history of life on Earth. So when he constructs this calculation, what he's saying is that humans right now are the best possibility for the Earth to become self-aware and self-regulating through human management. But the likelihood of it emerging again is astronomically small. So that means humans have to achieve this evolutionary transition or else the Earth will not achieve it. So when we look at this again and say, the developmental process for the caterpillar has a huge evolutionary history of developmental processes for the life plan of the organism. Here we are as humans trying to achieve an evolutionary transition, which is very unlikely to succeed, statistically speaking. It's a very rare event in the biosphere of the Earth. And the only way that it'll happen is if humans figure out how to do it, because humans have to do it to ourselves. And now we can see in a kind of astronomical sense, put it in the context of, of universe evolution, this may be the first planet to ever achieve this. This may be the only planet to achieve it. I mean, we, we know from astrobiology that, you know, bacteria are pretty likely to exist all over the universe. Multicellular organisms are pretty unlikely to exist. Eusocial multicellular organisms, less likely. Empathic, placental, we, there are arguments for why a placental uh, birth may be necessary for the parenting strategies that give rise to empathy in mammals, um, that placental birth may or may not emerge. And you just kind of go on and on through the details of this evolutionary story. And then you see that right now, like literally today, and in the next 10 years, humans have to figure out how to guide ourselves through an evolutionary transition of astronomical scales for our entire planet. And that's why these induction rituals are going to be so important and why we don't know how to do them. <laughs> we shouldn't expect to know how to do them. It's never happened before. <laughs> yeah. It seems like the best that we can do is just, you know, dive in and try to do it ourselves and look at how the ancients have done it, you know, for the in the time that they were alive that worked. You know, the path of the shaman is the same thing. Mm -hmm. where um, it's potentially even added pressure on top of a regular uh, rite of passage because then there's, you know, uh, a lot of the, these rituals are more prolonged uh, where, like, the youth will go out into the forest for a couple of years and, you know, eat psychedelic plants and subsist off of roots and be completely socially isolated and then come back with some sort of knowledge to share with the rest of the tribe. And a lot of the time that knowledge uh, seems to have to do with these kinds of, with basically with planetary consciousness and with ways that every living being is connected. I don't think that's an accident. Oh no, it's not an accident. Um, it's one of the really amazing things about humans, and this is explored in Paul Shepard's book, The Tender Carnivore. Paul Shepard's an anthropologist studying hunting behavior and its relationship to ritual performance, theatrical and musical dance performances. And one of the insights he articulates really beautifully is that humans need the ability to empathize with our prey to be able to hunt it successfully. So we have to read the tracks of the animal, know its behaviors. So in a sense, we have to love the animal to be able to kill it. And then there comes a moment where we have to kill it. And then we have to tear open its body and you know, have it's like blood on our fingers and it's an entrails on our hands. And we have to deal with the complex emotions that loving it enabled us to get to the place of destroying it. Yeah. And so we ritualize all of this and it's incredibly important. So this gets back to our food system. Look at how we, we have used industrial processes to kill large numbers of animals, 
plants, entire ecosystems to feed ourselves as humans because we cannot handle the emotions of having a personal relationship to our food. And so the personal relationship to food, if you just look at the complexity of emotions and ethics for veganism and see how lost we are because we don't have these rituals for, for developing ethically mature relationship to what we might need to kill. And so it's just, it's really important to understand that this is an essential piece of being human. Yeah, we talked about um, the concept of Omni Thrive, which uh, I think we got from uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger. And so it's this kind of planetary vision of what is the emergent system that in which every component is ultimately thriving and it is ultimately alive. And so within that system, obviously, predator, you know, the lion still eats the gazelle, but how does it work? Like at what point is it balanced that everything maximally thrives? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a quote right now because I want to read it um, from Peter Kropotkin, who's a, an evolutionary biologist and philosopher. And let, just while I'm looking for it, let me start by saying that um, one of the uh, elements of all of this is understanding how nested um, living systems work. And um, part of the way that nested living systems work can be explained by what John Fullerton describes in his approach to uh, regenerative economics. And specifically, he is, um, here's, I found the quote, but uh, he looked at how living systems applies to economics and he found that there's this principle that he calls empowered participation. Now, let me read this quote from Peter Kropotkin, who is a Russian um, a geneticist and philosopher, and he wrote this over 100 years ago. So uh, Kropotkin said this, each individual is a cosmos of organs. Each organ is a cosmos of cells. Each cell is a cosmos of an infinitely small ones. And in this complex world, the well-being of the whole depends entirely on the sum of the well-being enjoyed by each of the least microscopic particles of organized matter. A whole revolution is thus produced in the philosophy of science. So what he's getting at here is, I just posted this on Twitter yesterday, so the timing was really good. You know where to find the quote. But what he's getting at is that thriving, this omni-thriving that Daniel Schmattenberger is talking about, is just a principle of living systems. If your body cannot produce all the nutrients that your liver cell needs to survive, then your liver organ cannot survive because your liver cell is ill. If your liver organ is not able to function as part of a larger system, like a waste filtering system of your body, then that waste, or waste filtering system cannot thrive. If that waste filtering system cannot thrive, your entire organism as a body cannot thrive. So this idea of um, nested regeneration relates to what John Fullerton calls em, em, uh, empowered participation. Empowered participation means that the liver cell is able to contribute meaningfully to the health of the liver organ. The liver organ is able to contribute meaningfully to the waste filtering system of the body and so on. So when we think about empowered participation, notice how this translates right over to democracy take it out of the biological context, put it in the political context, and talking about democracy, and look at how we do not have empowered participation in the governance of our systems. And so we do not have regenerative economic practices in our political systems. Our political systems don't work like living systems. So I, I say it in this way because this makes it very concrete, that if you study how a cell within an organ within an organ system, within an organism, at each level, it needs to contribute meaningfully to the higher level, and the higher level needs to provide for the health and well-being of the lower level, then you're operating effectively. And now you have a way of managing it that is understandable. And then we can look at what does it mean to uh, grow our food for a village of people? It may turn out that village of people depends on a larger watershed with other villages of people. And so you find that, you know, going back to Ken Weber's idea of the whole on, that the relationship between holes and their parts is the right focus. 
and that you have to do nested analysis, look at different levels of nested relationships and look at the circulatory flows of nutrients and energy relationships. And um, uh, circulation flows is one of the other regenerative economic principles that John Fullerton has outlined. A third one is honoring of place and community. Think of that in terms of biology, the liver cell better honor the place and community of the individual, uh, you know, the liver organism and the body that it's in. So this idea translates between biology and culture uh, seamlessly because it's the same processes and the same principles. Different mechanisms for how it's done, but the principles are the same. So this is what is really essential is to create an omni-thrive game, a win-win-win game, is a game where there are up cycles and down cycles of beneficial relationship. What I do as an individual benefits the larger group, what the larger group benefits me as an individual. And when we think in this way, we can all find examples where it's worked and where it hasn't worked in our lives. We've all been parts of a team where the team worked really well and took care of us. We've all been parts of teams where that's not been the case. <laughs> and so, so we can go to these very tangible experiences to learn the lessons. But our challenge is to build it at a planetary scale, meaning for all scales below it. And I suppose for individuals, it has to start at the level where they have the most agency. Yeah, yeah. I had a conversation with a young woman two days ago who's a social entrepreneur interested in regenerative design. And I was talking to her about these regenerative economics principles. And I, I asked her to apply them to her own life because she didn't know how to make a decision about what to change. And I said, well, look at, you know, I just named a few of these regenerative principles. Apply them to your own life. Where do you feel a lack of empowered participation? What are the structures in your life that keep you from having it? How dramatically do you need to change your situation so that those constraints are no longer there? In her case, she was living in Oakland, part of the Silicon Valley scene of the Bay Area of, of California. And this, the implication was, you probably need to leave that place. You probably will not find empowered participation in your surroundings. You might need to change your surroundings. So you see how it opens up this question of, should I move or should I stay here? The life choices, you know, basic life choices, using regenerative principles to guide the way. And it's kind of like a self-diagnosis. You know, where do you get the circulatory flows that allow you to thrive? Where do you not? Or another way of asking that is, do you have a support system? You know, are you able to talk to your mother when you have problems? Do you have friends who help you out when you need, to, when you need help? You know, it becomes very tangible really quickly when you do it this way. Same thing in work, you know, is your work meaningfully contributing to not only your community, but, you know, the ecosystem at large, the biosphere? Because if you look at it just on a small level, then maybe you say like, yeah, I'm providing value, you know, in entrepreneurial circles, people love to talk about that. I'm providing value, but okay, what kind of impact is that actually having on the biosphere? Are you... Uh, regenerative or are you extractive? <laughs> yeah, and the thing about regenerative is, you know, for John Fullerton, he came up with eight principles. For Eleanor Ostrom, for governing common pool of assets, she found there were eight principles. They were articulated differently. But the important thing in both frameworks is that it only works when all of the principles are applying. And because uh, complexity emerges through the interactions of the different principles. To manage the commons, Eleanor Ostrom articulated that you have to have, uh, the group has to have identity and purpose. So the group needs to know who is in the group and who is not, and what the group is all about. I'm in the group because we're doing this thing. So I'm in a group that's trying to clean the water of a lake near my town. And so if you don't have shared identity and shared purpose, you don't have a group. So that's very interesting by itself, but now add to it one of the other principles which is that you need to have a way for the participants of the group to change the rules. If they don't like the rules for making decisions, they need a way to change them. That one's interesting by itself too, but now add a third one. When there are conflicts, you need to have a neutral arbiter. You need someone that everyone agrees will help them resolve their, their conflicts in a fair way. Add that one back to the first two and you start to see a dynamic interaction. So Eleanor Ostrom identified eight of these criteria, and by themselves, they're interesting, 
together, they're profound. When you start to combine them together, you start to see that for any group, it may work mostly because seven of the eight criteria are being met. But if you want it to work better, you identify which one of the criteria isn't working and you improve it. And it creates magic across all, you know, it seems like magic because it, it, it benefits all of the other processes because they're all interdependent with each other. Uh, we have a lot of resources for people at the end of this one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, Joe, this has been awesome. This has been really, really fun. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Um, type my name into Google and find me. I mean, seriously, it's easy. Uh, I'm on, uh, like I'm on Facebook, although I'm getting close to the 5,000 5, friend limit, which is annoying. Um, on LinkedIn, uh, I have a website, the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution, which is culturalevolution.org. I'm sorry, culturalevolutioncenter.org. Uh, I'm part of a group called Regenerative Communities Network, which is regenerativecommunities.net, uh, which is a good place to join and get involved. Um, but really, I'm easy to find. So just look for me and <laughs> there I am. <laughs> cool. Yeah, this is so this is so useful. Um the kind of the regenerative culture stuff. Yeah. It's so useful. Yeah, I like how that fits in with the rites of passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll notice like I'm drawing information from a lot of places. And this is the problem with our education system is it doesn't draw the information together to find that the problem only becomes solvable when you integrate the knowledge. And this is not what our universities do. Yeah. It's, it's like at the institution level, it's the same problem as at the personal level because, you know, they haven't reached teal level, basically, where they're able to integrate uh, all these different disparate um, areas of knowledge because there's a lot of really good research that has been done across different mm -hmm. fields. They're just not talking to each other. And there's no overarching kind of theory of everything or, a, you know, kind of a practice that can reach across all of these different disciplines. Yeah, I've called this culture design and uh, other people have different names for it. But the idea is that uh, we have to design for changes in whole systems. And whole systems change requires a kind of uh, transdisciplinary synthesis. You have to put together knowledge from different areas. And that is its own skill set. And you don't need everyone to be doing it. Actually, you wouldn't get very far if everyone was doing it. Everyone spending their time learning about a hundred different topics and putting them together, nothing would get done. But as people are doing the work, there are frameworks for combining the pieces. And uh, there's actually a group called the Transformations Forum. And Steve Waddell is one of the kind of, he's a cat herder of that group, you know, helping to organize people. And what they are doing, they organize a, a couple of different international meetings per year. And they've been going for three or four years now. Um, what they do is develop a rigorous approach to transformational systems change. And what they found is that there is a practice. There are people who do transformational systems change, and those people are now organizing to teach each other what they do to create a field of transformational systems change. And one of the big places where um, transformations don't happen is in the way that things get evaluated. So if you look at evaluation, evaluation has gotten very good at seeing if a program works. You implement a new school lunch program in a school, program evaluation can tell you very well if it worked and why it did work, why it didn't work. But that kind of program evaluation doesn't change a system. And then there's a kind of process-oriented or developmental evaluation where you can study how a system is changing and evaluate its progress. And people have figured out how to do this pretty well. And you can see how this relates to transformational change, but studying how a, system's a system is, is changing doesn't tell you how to transform it. So there's this third level, which is how do you evaluate the system capacities of the systems as they're changing to figure out what kinds of transformational supports are needed so that the system can be transformed. That's a whole different level of evaluation. Mm -hmm. There's a guy uh, in, uh, in Maine, his name's Glenn Page, who works with the Transformations Forum. I've just started talking with him recently, who is part of a group 
they, they're calling it blue marble evaluation, which is evaluating the transformational systems change capacities of systems change efforts. So you're evaluating what is needed in the process of changing systems so that it's possible for the systems to be transformed. And it turns out that to do that, you need earth system science because a lot of the things driving changes in the systems are like the ocean currents are changing because the Greenland ice sheet is melting, which is shifting the fisheries, which requires us to change the management of the fisheries. Yeah, so you end up with this connection between earth system science, human system management, and evaluation of their interrelatedness. And so um, this is a realm of practice. Um, there's actually a book that's just about to go to the publisher on blue marble evaluation about this. But you see how there's this body of research and practice that is doing the synthesis. Almost no one knows it exists. Uh, <laughs> and it's so urgently needed. <laughs> so it's almost like we need pollinators, people who, are, who have enough authority to be able to present these ideas where they're needed and who are articulate enough and educated enough to be able to transmit these ideas. That's a part of it. Another piece is we need frameworks of collaboration driven by need. So there's a problem that's chronic for an entire area and no one can solve the problem on their own. So they need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. They create a framework of collaboration to start to address the problem. And then these people can come in and be facilitators. And this is what we're doing with the Regenerative Communities Network is we're building a global network of place-based projects where they're doing multi-stakeholder collaboration for their region. So they're changing the region through collaboration to deal with chronic problems for their region mm -hmm. and then building a network so learning can happen from region to region. And so uh, this idea of um, people having the skill to do this in the absence of practice doesn't help anyone. But when we have a place where people need to practice transforming systems, then these people have a practice to do. So we create the, the context for the practice is a chronic problem that requires cooperation to be solved. A framework of cooperation is developed collaboratively with the participants to collectively solve it. And these people become practitioners to facilitate that process. And any of those pieces without the others doesn't work. Have you looked into uh, DAOs? Do you participate in any DAOs? Decentralized Autonomous Organizations? Yeah, I have not participated in DAOs myself, but I, I'm aware of them and what they do. And I see them as um, within the right, um, I might just say the right social dynamics where people are doing things that uh, they're really trying to accomplish hard things. I see DAOs and blockchain and holochain and cryptocurrencies and token systems, this whole realm of what we might just call cybernetic supports. Um, they become essential as the human management systems are set up. I think uh, they are a lot of wasted energy and effort right now because they're not part of these collaboration frameworks. And, and it's, some of them are, so I'm not, saying, I'm not wanting to make a blanket statement about them. But if you look at how much energy is going into something like uh, cryptocurrencies or blockchain technologies, a lot of it is wasted money and effort because it's not part of real world collaboration projects. But in real world collaboration projects to come in and say, we will create a token system for monitoring value exchanges. Well, now we're rocking, now we're onto something. And so I see DAOs as being really powerful for the social system learning of the people doing these collaborative projects. Especially when you add something like GIS and um, monitoring of ecosystems, which you can do with drones and monitoring systems, and then all the social exchanges of value and information, and the connecting of one local economy to another, so you can have good bookkeeping and accounting of things. How do you do valuation for the asset classes when the assets, asset classes are new and we don't know what their value is? Like All of this stuff is essential for investment to flow into regenerative projects. And this is where I see these cybernetic technologies being really powerful. But until they land in these kinds of projects and really demonstrate themselves as part of them, 
they're kind of wasted effort. And I think plenty of people doing work with them, the, the work that is directed toward railroad collaborative projects is likely to succeed and prove invaluable. I just have one more question before we go. Um, this is a question we've been asking a lot lately of some of our guests. Um, I'd like to know if you have any really specific for advice for young people about how to be better adapted to the future. Well, the, the main thing that young people need to know is that absolutely nothing about right now is normal. Absolutely nothing is normal. So if they think the future is anything like the present, they are setting themselves up for heartbreak. The best thing that they can do is learn how dramatically and powerfully the world is changing and prepare for them, prepare themselves to not know. Mm -hmm. They need to prepare themselves to not know. They need to realize that they cannot know what is coming and they have to handle that. There are lots of ways they can do this. One of the best things would be to uh, grapple with uncertainty together. Talk to their friends about why they can't know things. Why can't we know when the speculative bubble in the financial system is going to collapse? Why can't we know when an earthquake is going to happen? Why can't we know if it's going to rain at 3 o'clock or 3.15 this afternoon because of the way the clouds form? Like, there are good ways to practice. You know, why can't you know what, which team is going to win in a sporting event? So to practice not knowing is going to be really important because the future is going to be so different from the present. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think this is really a, a foundational thing. There's a lot more that young people need to know and work on, but this is like a daily practice that they could do is, well, what, you know, instead of what do I know, it's uh, today, what don't I know? Um, at the end of the day, just spend five minutes thinking about something you didn't know was going to happen that day. Yeah. I didn't know what was going to happen in our conversation, you know, so, so you can practice this in a really basic way. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Good advice. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Thanks yeah no. This has been uh, yeah. super relevant because uh, we're also trying to kind of piece, piece this puzzle from our own way and uh, from our own backgrounds. And this, I don't know, it, it filled a yeah, certain... It filled uh, some gaps. Filled some gaps for me. That was great. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I hope it does for other people too. And you know, just let me know if you'd like to talk again because I'd be happy to come and talk again. I think we definitely would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Cool. Nice to meet you. Take care. Yeah, nice to meet you too. All right. That was it for the second part of our conversation with Joe Brewer. You can find all the links and show notes with numerous references from this interview at futurethinkers.org 91. To check out the first part of this interview, go to futurethinkers.org 90. And if you want to stay up to date with our latest episodes, blog posts, or news from Future Thinkers, join our mailing list at futurethinkers.org slash mailing list. To meet like-minded people, join our Future Thinkers Discord community. Go to futurethinkers.org slash discord. Check out A Course in Personal Evolution, Adapting Age-Old Wisdom for a Modern Life of Purpose and Meaning. Go to futurethinkers.org slash evolution. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, consider donating or becoming a patron at futurethinkers.org slash support. Also visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase.